Okay, next we have uh, Michael Pollock from the BC Ministry of Agriculture, the Animal Health Centre in Abbotsford, and he's going to talk about zoonotic pathogens in fish. Uh, sorry, I'm going to steal this. Testing. All right, sweet. Uh, so, yeah, I first heard of this symposium like a few weeks ago, and somehow I got suckered into presenting, so uh, <laughs> this all came all at once, so hopefully it's somewhat coherent. Um, so, uh, zoonotic diseases of fish is a topic that I guess is often overlooked. I've noticed even on the uh, brochure you didn't have a picture of a fish, but you had a picture of a killer whale. So, um, <laughs> now there are a number of diseases in fish that can be transmitted to people, but uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I decided to focus on three of the ones that you're more commonly, to, uh, more likely to encounter. So, uh, just a bit of an introduction before I get into the diseases. Uh, it's important to consider that there is a large phylogenetic gap and ecological gap between fish and humans. Uh, as a result, there's relatively little opportunity for transmission, unless you swim a lot, and uh, there are rel relatively few diseases that are host adapted to both fish and people. So as a result, most of the zoonotic diseases you encounter are going to be either foodborne illnesses, opportunistic pathogens with a broad host range, so they're indiscriminate in who they infect, or parasites with complex life cycles, so which actually depend on the, the predatory, or sorry, predator prey relation between you know humans and fish. Um, and naturally, people that are more predisposed to infection are those that work with fish a lot, so fishermen uh, or aquarists, and people that consume fish, so the Japanese and people who live in Vancouver. Um, uh, so the first disease I wanted to cover was mycobacteriosis. So this causes. Uh, 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 it's more commonly known as, I think, uh, fish tank granulomas. So uh, mycobacteria are a genus of bacteria that are characterized as being uh, aerobic, gram-positive, acid-fast positive, positive rod-shaped, pleomorphic, non-motel bacteria. So they're virtually ubiquitous in both freshwater and marine environments. And the ones that are most commonly associated with infections in fish are mycobacteria marinum, chelonae, and fortuitum. They also are common pathogens in frogs. So these are non-tuberculous variants of the bacteria, so they don't form the classic tuberculosis lesions like Mycobacterium tuberculosis or M. bovis. Uh, species of fish that are most predisposed to infection tend to be cyprinids, so these are like the carp, uh, uh, goldfish. Uh, the tracids, so these are common uh, aquarium fish, so like the tetras, for example. Uh, bass and tilapia. Uh, human infections tend to be opportunistic, typically in immunosuppressed peeps, but it can affect healthy individuals as well. Uh, so transmission between fish is usually by bites and spine pricks or the consumption of infected tissue. So if you can imagine you have a, 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 an aquarium, fish that's infected dies, all the other fish are gonna start scavenging on this body and are more likely to come into contact with the bacteria. So uh, transmission between fish and humans uh, tends to be via inoculation. So people that handle fish can get pricked with spines or they can cut themselves with contaminated knives and utensils, so usually when preparing seafood. Uh, you can also get exposure via contamination of open wounds. So if you swim in pools that aren't treated with chlorine, or God forbid, swim in a fish pond, or <laughs> uh, clean your aquarium, you're more likely to come in contact with this bacteria. Uh, so diagnosis can be tricky, uh, given that the incubation period uh, can be weeks to months, there's often that dissociation between, oh, yeah, I cut myself in a swimming pool, and then I develop this granuloma, because it can happen months later. So uh, you can culture the bacteria, but it is pretty slow growing, so molecular techniques are often the best way to go forward with that. So uh, in terms of controlling the pathogen, uh, if, if you're worried about getting it from an aquarium or a fish pond, usually depopulation and disinfection is, is the most drastic and effective route. Uh, the bacteria are susceptible to some of the more common disinfectants like ethanol, Lysol, and sodium hypochlorite. Uh, obviously, you don't want to kill all the fish in your aquarium, so some people usually just live with it. And uh, you can protect yourself from exposure by wearing proper personal protective equipment, so gloves when handling fish, and for God's sakes, don't swim in fish ponds. <laughs> uh, treatment, Mycobacterium marinum, which is the one that's most commonly associated with human infections, is naturally resistant to a number of antibiotics, so treatment can be tricky. Uh, but I guess the rule of thumb is uh, 
you want to treat it as soon as possible. Usually it starts with a, a skin infection and then it progresses into deeper tissues. And skin infections tend to respond quite well to antibiotics once it starts getting to deeper tissues, like the lymph nodes and such. It can be a bit trickier to treat and it usually requires multiple antibiotics uh, and sometimes surgery. Um, pathology is largely dependent on the immune status of the host and the virulence of the bacteria. Uh, Mycobacteria are, are well known because they can persist and replicate within macrophages. So even if your immune system, you know, phagocytizes the bacteria, they can live there for, for years after, and they can even continue to spread after they infect the macrophages by exiting the phagosomes and, you know, spreading between the cells. So uh, we're more interested in human pathology, so I'll skip the fish one. But um, in humans, infections typically manifest as ulcers of the skin and skin nodules. They can be painful to painless. Uh, as the progression spreads, it usually goes to the local lymph nodes first, so you might develop lymphadenitis, and in worst case scenario, you would get arthritis, tenosynovitis, and osteomyelitis, so infections of the bones and joints from the point of entry. And it, some species of mycobacteria can actually uh, manifest as bone and joint infections without having prior skin lesions, so it's important to consider. Uh, systemic infections are generally rare but they can happen in immunocompromised individuals. And so this is just an image of uh, a pregnant woman that was cleaning her uh, uh, aquarium. And when you're pregnant, you tend to be a little bit more immunosuppressed, so you're more susceptible to infection. And you can see all these ulcerative nodules that developed on her hand. So the next disease I was gonna cover was diphyllobothriasis. So this is fish tapeworms. Um, diphyllobothrium is a genus of cestodes that's specialized in infecting piscivorous animals, so fish-eating animals, uh, both birds and mammals. So there are a number of species, all of which vary in their geographic distribution and host range. Uh, life cycle is complex, uh, but generally speaking, they have a definitive host and two intermediate hosts. Definitive host is always a piscivorous animal. Uh, the adult worm lives within the small intestine, kind of attached to the mucosa, and as it grows, it releases Proglotted, so these little uh, segments that pretty much are just reproductive factories. They produce eggs. Uh, they're shed into the environment uh, through defecation, and then the eggs release coracidia, which are these little ciliated larvae. Uh, the larvae are picked up by crustaceans, that being the first intermediate host, where they develop into a procercoid, which is the infective stage to the second intermediate host, uh, which is usually a fish. So once the fish eats the crustacean, the procercoid is released in the gut, bores through the intestine, and uh, enters into either the body cavity or the surrounding tissues, or it develops into the pleurocircoid, which is the next larval stage that is then infectious to the definitive host. Uh, so in terms of zoonotic potential in Canada, there are, I would say, four species that are more likely to, you, you'd be more likely to encounter these ones. So Diphyllobathrum latum would be the most common cause of human infections. And worldwide, it's uh, estimated there are 10 to 20 million cases. Uh, definitive host is usually, uh, in addition to humans, uh, dogs and cats. And uh, the infection is usually acquired by eating certain freshwater fish, like perch, pike, and burbot. Then we have Diphyllobothrum dendriticum, which is more of a jack-of-all-trades, so it's fairly non-host specific. It can affect a number of different species of piscivorous birds and mammals. And uh, the intermediate host can be any number of species of fish, but usually salmonids, so trout. Staphylobothrum ursi rarely causes human infections. I think there's only been a few reported cases, but uh, it usually cycles between bears and sockeye salmon. That's throughout the Pacific Northwest. And then we have Diphyllobothrium nihon kaiens. <laughs> Not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, and this is a disease that was almost exclusively reported in Japan, but there have been a uh, few reports in uh, the United States, Canada, and some other countries, and it's usually associated with uh, imported fish, so probably from areas around Japan. So uh, this is just an image of the adult uh, cestode. So on the bottom, it can get up to 20 meters in length, so it's quite impressive. Uh, and then in the image above, we have the pleurocircoids. So those are the infective larvae. I'm not sure if you can see them. Let's see if you can put, so there it is. It looks like a little, oh, geez, never mind. Go back. Uh, it looks like a little strap of tape uh, that can be either free within the uh, uh, cylindrical cavity or kind of boring within tissues. And so that's the infective stage. If you see that, don't eat it. <laughs> Seems obvious, yet somehow people get infected. Uh, 
So uh, transmission is via the consumption of undercooked meat. Uh, fortunately, the clinical signs of infection are quite mild, so it's usually asymptomatic. You might feel a bit of abdominal discomfort, and for those who don't like to exercise, weight loss is always a benefit. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, as far as diagnosis, you can do fecal floats or uh, fecal examinations and look for the morphology of the proglottids, which are these little segments you see here. Or uh, it has, uh, the eggs also have a characteristic morphology in that they are percolated. So most cestodes do not have a percolated eggs, meaning that they have that little hat on top. That tends to be more characteristic of trematodes, uh, but this is a cestode species that has that. So uh, treatment is quite simple. So usually you take a single dose of Quantil, which is an anti-helminthic, and 20 meters later, you're good to go. So, <laughs> uh, the next disease I was going to talk about is anisacidosis. So, this one's a bit more serious. Uh, so, anisacidae is a group of parasitic nematodes, or roundworms, that typically infect marine mammals. So, uh, they're global in their distribution, and they have a broad host range, so they can affect various fish species. Now, the definitive host is really dependent on the genus and species that you're dealing with. So Anasacus is largely a, a nematode of cetaceans, so porpoises, whales, and such. Uh, and then Pseudoterranova and Contracecum are parasites of pinnipeds. All of them can affect people. So the life cycle is also complex and very similar to that of Dactylobothrium in that you have the adults living in the stomach, they shed eggs into the environment through defecation, and then they go up the food chain from your crustaceans to your smaller fish, and then they can get passed up to larger fish, and then eventually to the definitive host that it naturally encounters, or people. So transmission, again, is via the consumption of undercooked meat. So you can see a nice cod filet in its grocery packing, and there's a little worm up in here. Now, based on the fact that it's a cod and its color, it's likely pseudoterranola. Don't eat it. Um, <laughs> infected fish, you can usually identify uh, by the presence of gastric ulcers, that's where the larva bore through the GI tract into the tissues, or you can also identify the nematode free within the peritoneal cavity or embedded within the tissues. Uh, in humans, uh, you'll often know that you're infected because you will experience abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, the pathology that's associated with infection includes gastric ulceration, or in the unlikely event that it migrates outside of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, you can get eosinophilic granulomas and a number of other neighboring tissues. Uh, so the image on below is just an, I mean, it is a pinniped, but I couldn't find a human picture, so you're just gonna have to imagine. Uh, that is the mucosa of the stomach, and you have this like craterous volcanic ulcer with a bunch of nematodes boring into the wall. So, but that's what your stomach would look like too. So um, <laughs> in uh, a small percentage of people, you can also develop hypersensitivities to the parasite. So uh, if you're, exposed to it at one point in your life and you develop the hypersensitivity uh, and then you're re-exposed to it, you can get all the signs of allergies. So you can, you can develop uh, hives or dicaria, uh, you can get bronchoconstriction and in rare cases anaphylaxis which can kill you. Um, so control and prevention. So uh, fortunately the parasite is quite visible so you can remove it during processing and they often use candling, ultraviolet fluorescence to aid. So, uh, candling would be like shining a bright light through the fillet and you'd be able to see kind of the worm embedded in the muscle, so that kind of helps in identifying it. Um, if you didn't want to pull it out and you don't mind a little extra protein, you can also cook it for a few minutes at 60 degrees Celsius or freeze it at minus 20 for over 24 hours. And that's usually the common approach because sushi, obviously, you can't cook. Um, it's important to note, though, that removing the parasite does not remove the allergens and the allergens can also be temperature resistant. So even if there's no worm, doesn't mean you won't develop hypersensitivity reactions to it. Uh, some countries have even resorted to controlling populations of pinnipeds, so seals and sea lions, within the area where they fish lots, but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, diagnosis is via, you can, the history in, in general, if you, if you know you eat lots of fish, that's something to be aware of. Uh, CBC would often show eosinophilia, which is common in all parasitic infections, so your eosinophil count would go up. And then you can also visualize the parasite itself via ultrasound or endoscopy. So uh, treatment really depends on the type of infection you're dealing with. So they, they're usually quite responsive to anti-homethic drugs, 
If they're confined to the stomach, you can remove them via endoscopy. So that's the image you see on the bottom right. So little forceps, grabbing it, pulling it out of the wall. Or in the case of extraintestinal migration, treatment's a bit more complicated and usually requires surgery. Uh, so hopefully I haven't turned you guys off sushi, but uh, it's not very common. It obviously, it's more common in, in places where they eat lots of fish fry. Uh, I guess I could open the floor to questions or we can sure, pursue them. So if anyone had any questions? No? What's for lunch? <laughs> 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 Excellent. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um,